as an honor and a tribute to a lifelong friend who I classify as a brother. Ted and I grew up in the northwest area of Detroit on a street called North Lawn. And it was populated by tons of kids at that time. It was a community where parents knew the children who belonged to other parents and looked after them. My first meeting of Ted was when he was about 14 years old. And I ask you to bear with me as I describe it because it is indented in my memory forever. Our neighborhood revolved around everybody being outside at all seasons. And so on this beautiful summery day, down North Lawn Avenue rides this individual who we had not seen because the bars were late coming to the neighborhood. In fact, their house was just about the last one built on North Lawn. But I couldn't help stop and lend a stare at this individual in a blue button-down shirt, Levi's, Indian moccasins on a two-wheel racing 10-speed bike who made an indelible impression upon me. And I said, who is this individual? He's not one of us. Because we all had balloon tire bikes at that point in time. And that's my first meeting with Ted Barr. As I mentioned, it was a community where one another lived in the homes of their friends. And the Barr household was exactly like that. Only it was extremely unique in that the Barr household had some unusual names for relatives, like Aunt Mushy. And then if that wasn't enough, there was another aunt by the name of Nutsi. And one stopped for a moment and said, who are these people, until they met them. And then you, you, you realize that the name fit them very, very well, based on how they looked and their actions. Um, Ted's house was always welcoming, and Bernie and Sarah were just lovely people. Marilyn kind of avoided us. And Diane was so young, she was hid somewhere doing whatever she was doing. But we, we, we managed to harass them along the way. The famous story in the Gould household that lived on infinitum was the story about my bicycle, my two-wheel bicycle. And the story goes like this. Ted, being an enterprising young man, at a relatively early age, had a paper route. And his bike, being that it was this sophisticated racing bike, could not accommodate the bags to hold the papers. And so he asked me, could he borrow my bike? And what are friends for? And so I lent him the bike. And as I was turning close to 16, one did not ride their bike anymore. One drove cars. And thus, the bike disappeared from the Gould household, with the exception of my father, who was always asking me, when will the bike return? <laughs> the bike never returned. But a number of years later, when my son was bar mitzvahed, and Carol and Ted attended this wonderful life cycle event, and Ted said, in addition to a present for your grandson, I have another present. And he brought me in. This big plastic case inside was this miniature bicycle. And on it was a little tab that said, here is the bicycle that I never returned to you. <laughs> That's the kind of guy Ted was. Ted was also a very unusual individual in that he was focused. 
Um, at a relatively young age, because of his gift for gab, he worked in a men's haberdashery. And it was Father's Day, and they were taking on help in the haberdashery. And he said, Paul, come on over. I've got a job for you at Helpburns. You're going to sell clothes. What I knew about clothes, you could stuff in a thimble. And so I said, Ted, I, I don't know what to do. He said, stick with me, kid. I'll show you. Realize that Ted was younger than I was. I'm the kid, he said. And so a client walked in. He was interested in a shirt. Ted brought out the shirt. And then he started giving the pitch to the client about how it would fit, how it would look. And by the way, this is the bar weave. So it, it is outstanding in its quality. And the gentleman said, bar weave? Absolutely, imported from Italy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Ted Barr. And that immediately was an indication of his ability to sell a product. The next encounter of significance is, and we were tight. We were, we were a family of friends that you could call on anytime, any place for anything. And growing up, as many can imagine being parents and grandparents, the fact that there is that point in time where there's little controversy between parents and children. And that was the case with Ted and Bernie and Sarah. Ted calls me one night when I'm up at college, and he said, I've had a fight with my parents. I want to come up and crash at your place. And of course, the door is open for you. Came up, we had a long talk, went to bed. He got up the next morning, had breakfast, went home. Everything was good. He just had to get away from the homestead. Ted was a unique individual in that amongst our friends in the neighborhood, there was a gentleman by the name of Rudy Lightman. He was the father of a dear friend. Rudy was the top salesman for New York life. And Ted early on said to me, one day I'm going to have that as my goal, to be the top salesman in the field. And lo and behold, it came to pass. Some other significant incidents in my life with Ted, and there are many. Ted got a job at a resort in the Catskills in New York called the Concord. And in 1963, just yesterday, my beloved wife of 53 years and I honeymooned at the Concord. And there was my best friend serving champagne, complimentary, if you will, on the Concord. Little did they know he stuffed the bill in some other guest's <laughs> pocket. One day I came home uh, and stopped by the bar residence just to say hello, which was my occasion after coming home uh, from college, and I walked in, Ted had graduated, and he said, you know, your timing is perfect because I'm leaving tonight for New York. And I said, what are you gonna do? He says, I'm gonna crash out of Fraternity Brothers' apartment and look for a job, and that he did. Even though distance separated us, the friendship always was there. And we had the occasion to visit Carol and Ted shortly after they were married. Of course, Arlene had an ulterior motive because at that time, Ted was a representative for Gay Gibson and the sample sales were there. And Arlene, as we walked in, her eyes lit up, a smile was on her face, she was in heaven. Not only did my best friend have a deep relationship with me, but he now became Arlene's new best friend with the line that he was carrying. The other thing about Ted, which was 
in my opinion, so unique is that he was a risk taker because he built his line up tremendously in the territory that he had here. He was fortunate to find the love of his life. And in addition to that, he told me one day that he was studying for the series eight exams to become a insurance representative, which he did and succeeded tremendously in the field. Ted to me was like a brother because we could share life's experiences. He was my rock when I needed him. He also became my financial planner. And to this date, Arlene and I are living the dream because of my friend. Thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts and life experiences with my friend, Ted Barr. morning. My name is Joel Finkelstein. I don't go back as many years as Paul did with Ted. I only go back some 55 or 56 years. I uh, met Ted at the Concord in the Catskills where we were bar waiters in the same room. We were not in the room that was home to the Big Axe. We were bar waiters in a small room that had a jazz band. And uh, our careers at the Concord overlapped by three years. Ted was in college, earning extra money, and I was in law school, earning extra money. I had the good fortune of not only working in the same room with Ted, but becoming very close to Ted. We were young men in our early 20s. We were in search of a future, trying to lay the foundation for what life would offer us in the next 40 or 50 or 60 years, whatever we had. Some of the things Paul said, uh, I certainly observed in Ted. He was entrepreneurial, to say the least. But Ted, um, as I observed him in the three years that we worked together, or the three summers, I should say, that we worked together at the Concord, was way beyond entrepreneurial. It's easy at times like this to exaggerate and to embellish and to say things that are attractive and good for the moment. Uh, with Ted, it's very easy to tell you what really happened. Ted was an innovator. Ted was an achiever, characteristics which he held throughout his life. And it showed just in this room there where we worked. The room had five stations assigned to different waiters, two of which were premier and assigned to men who worked year round. But the best station for the college kids, as we were referred to, was Ted's. I, to this day, don't know how he got it, <laughs> but he got it, and it was the most lucrative of all the stations for the college kids. He was an extraordinary bar waiter, because there's a skill to bar waiting. He was engaging. He was energetic. He connected with his customers, and he did very well with his tips. He also was quite innovative when it came to other activities at the Concord, some of which I cannot talk about here. <laughs> One of the rules at the Concord was is that the, the help, the employees, we were not allowed to use the facilities and to congregate with the guests. 
somehow Ted figured out a way to go to the pool every day. <laughs> and I was the beneficiary of Ted's activities because I went with him. And somehow he got past security and somehow he roamed the pool and somehow he always ended up in the single section. This went on for three years. That was, t that was Ted. We also spent a great deal of time, what I call off campus. We didn't just work in the same room. We just didn't go to the pool together. We spent days off together. In fact, I had relatives in Westchester about an hour's drive from the Catskills and often we'd be so tired and our feet would be so blistered from the work that we did. We would just want two days of peace and quiet and I would often drive down to my aunt's house in Westchester just to rest. And on occasion, I would take Ted with me, and that's all we would do, is rest and talk like young men. Often talk about uh, what we were doing, what we were studying, and what our hopes for the future were. Uh, and so we became quite close during those years. I finished law school and came to Washington to work as a lawyer. Ted finished his college studies and went to New York to work in the motion pic picture business. We kept in touch and we reconnected several years later when he came to this area. We happened to live in the same apartment complex on the Beltway. The notes in the handout that was on the table as we walked in indicated that by happenstance, Ted ended up in a Greenbelt apartment near the Beltway. My memory is a little different, and it may not be all that accurate because at this age, the memory isn't all that reliable. But Ted and I we kept in touch, and I think he ended up at that co apartment complex because it was a complex he chose where he had a friend or friends. And what a choice it was. Uh, he came to Greenbelt, and he represented the Gay Gibson line dresses quite successful at that. But Ted um, at that garden apartment complex was as innovative and, in his, and as much of an achiever as he was as a bar waiter. Because who does he strike up a romance with but the most beautiful, the loveliest woman in the entire complex, if not in the entire suburbs. And he ended up, of course, marrying her. That was Ted Barr. He then moved on uh, and to suburbia, as did I. And we, in a way, went our separate ways in that he became a certified financial planner and I became involved in a law practice. And the geography between us also became a little more pronounced in that I lived in the city and he lived out in the suburbs. Nonetheless, uh, we kept in touch and we saw each other socially. We went to the various family milestones, the bat mitzvahs, the bar mitzvahs, the weddings. But Ted in his suburbia life, I think showed the same characteristics that he showed bar waiting and that he showed in and around the garden apartment complex that we loved. He excelled. <laughs> he was extraordinary. He and Carol produced two wonderful children and raised three wonderful children. Um, they're here. And all of you, I'm, I'm sure, know them. He not only um, procreated quite well, uh, but he was active in community and religious affairs. Ted was Jewish and he was proud of his heritage. And so like everything else he did, he didn't just join a synagogue, he joined and became active in a synagogue. I traveled to Israel with Ted and spent a week with Ted in Israel, which was an extraordinary experience on its own. It was, a, it was a, an extraordinary journey 
watching Ted and traveling with him on a sort of a parallel universe. Go from young adult to marrying, to having children, to having grandchildren, to being successful in business and be active in his community. Ted was not a giant on the world stage, but he was a giant in the limited circle that we all have with family and friends. The example he set for all of us in particular for his children and grandchildren is exemplary. He, he will be missed. And indeed, um, I will miss him very much. If you're concerned about this, I found the thing they put under the chair that says this can be redeemed for a free lunch here. <laughs> I looked under the adjoining chairs, but I didn't see any others. So this cannot be yours, except for perhaps a donation to the <laughs> social benefits that go on here. Well, <laughs> my. My name's Dan Little. That's spelled L-I-T-T-L-E. Yeah. And I'm here to talk to you about St. Theodore. Because I was sitting over there, and I, the first two speakers were so eloquent that I couldn't recognize the guy that I'd known <laughs> since 1972. I, I, was, I lost count because I think he had five different jobs before I ran into him, and he couldn't keep any of them. <laughs> well, I mean, but we became very close friends because we were very good competitors. We both married up. Uh, <laughs> the people in the hotel that I was staying at, and I had to come early because I don't really observe time the way most of you do, but my wife surprised the maids that came by because she was swearing in at least two languages they weren't familiar with. And I finally had to keep her out of the room until I finished getting dressed. But I'm delighted to be here. I am in the insurance business. The insurance business is where Ted and I found a home. And together, we kept each other in the insurance business because if you've ever bought anything from an insurance person, except for perhaps delousing, you're saying to yourself, why did I go through that? Ted and I took the road less traveled. We were interested only in talking to people who wanted to talk to us about our business. That saved us a lot of time. We could be home with the kids. We were never thrown out of anybody's house. In fact, they shook our hands as we left because they said, thank God, that only took about 12 minutes. <laughs> and we were delighted to leave. Through the years, uh, I can't even tell you about the adventures. The Barr family, fortunately, is sworn to silence. So they won't tell you about them. But he was, what is the word, mensch? Is that it? That's, that's the word. He was mensch. I don't know what that means, but I'm Irish Catholic, so I, I guess I don't need to know about that. <laughs> when Ted and I traveled, he was taller than me, so he got in to go first at anything we were doing. And I think half the people that we were at these various conferences and one thing and another thought I was his valet <laughs> or his chauffeur. And he kept that up. <laughs> and, it, and it took us through various places in our lifetime and has turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. Now, with that aside, I'm going to tell you about the other side of him. He and I were always afraid that we would not find somebody that wanted to talk to us about our business. So 
we sat down and had a drink. He was a scotch drinker. I wasn't. Fortunately, the Irish got into the whiskey business before the Scots, so we had a good time reminiscing over this could have been better, this could have been better, I didn't ask this, I didn't. This is what you do when you are in sales. And it's liberating because you never end up blaming yourself for something that didn't happen. It was always, you know, you got a bad one there. And I would blame him as much as he would blame me. Now, toward the end, and I've heard everything that you can possibly say about a man, and, and I agree with all of it. Toward the end uh, of his life, we had a final visit um, and talked about things that we normally wouldn't talk about. We talked about God. We talked about death. We talked about everything, our, our good fortune in our family. And that was the moment, I guess, and I spent, I guess, what, about an hour or so with him? He cried, I cried, I might cry today. We drank a little whiskey. He said, I don't know what's gonna happen. I said, well, you are a child of God. Now, I don't know why I said that, but I said it. Didn't get into whether you're Jewish, whether you're Catholic, whether you want a big oak casket, whether you want to be dropped in a hole. I said, you are a child of God. <clears throat> And, and you are not forgotten for that reason only. Everything these fellows had to say, to me anyway, listening, affirmed it. Growing up with him in the professional business that we were in, affirmed it. Now, I don't have much to say now, but there was, <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with this. And this is Ted Barb. This is vintage. We were in one place in Minnesota, and at, at two in the morning in Minnesota, there's not a lot of things to do. So <laughs> we called other guests in the hotel to find out what they were doing. <laughs> and it, it kind of pepped us up. I mean, we felt pretty good. And at the end of it, we had several visitors that came to our room, none of whom we could invite in because for a, vari a variety of reasons. But there was always that uncertainty of when something would happen that was unexplainable. It happened to me last night. In between sneezing my head off because you people have a pollen problem that is just <laughs> unbelievable. I was turning over in my mind the things to say and I decided at a quarter to 12 I'd go to bed. As I was heading toward bed, the phone rang in the hotel. And here's how I answer a phone, Dan Little speaking. I don't want to make anybody upset by what I'm saying, so that was the easiest thing. It was the guy down at the uh, desk. He said, Mr. Little? Yeah. Do you want your pizza delivered to your room or do you want to come down here and collect them? <laughs> <laughs> There's a list of things and people that would do this to me. <laughs> but there was not another Dan Little in that hotel I didn't share this with my wife except to say, I'm not gonna take uh, delivery of the pizza. I went to bed and started to laugh because somewhere in that universe, <laughs> last night, <laughs> Ted Barr said hi. Nobody else could have done that. <laughs> it's impossible, but he did it. I thank you for letting me speak with you. Again, this is available if you want to buy it. <laughs> and may God bless us all. All right, this is the first time I got to actually look at the room here. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, in case you don't know, my name is Adam. Ted was my dad. Uh, kind of have a narrative here that will be interrupted by some random thoughts from time to time. So thank you for indulging me. Uh, so here we go. Um, 
So when I was five years old, I announced that <clears throat> one day I was going to be the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And my dad told me to find a backup plan. <laughs> uh, so that, that was kind of my dad. He was a planner, he was a realist, and he was a pragmatist. And he was a grinder. Um, what he may have lacked in grace, he made up for with effort, definitely. And, and we had some tough times like dads and sons do. And when I was 12, I decided I, I simply wasn't going to speak to him anymore. That we would live a mutual existence. We'd pass in the halls of our home. We'd even break bread at the same table. But I just wasn't going to talk to him anymore because I was angry. Um, I was a burgeoning teenager. He yelled too much. He jumped too quickly to conclusions. He didn't understand my football. He didn't understand my passions. And he didn't understand me, really. And to be honest, we lived like that for, for almost six years. And I, I was angry. Um, ours wasn't always the easiest house to grow up in. I had no idea what other houses were like. I only imagined they were idyllic and peaceful, much like the 80s sitcom world upon which I was raised. I didn't know such a world didn't actually, actually exist. I didn't know that a perfect parent didn't exist. And I didn't know that my behavior was a perpetuation of a self-fulfilling reality in which I was creating in myself the, the very traits in my dad that I didn't like. At times he had a short temper, at times he had a judgmental eye, and he certainly at times had a cynical temperament. Well, I was, I was 12 almost 30 years ago, and fortunately my dad and I came along a long way during that time. I learned that what was indeed a short temper and my dad was spurned really by fear. He had a great fear of failure. He feared that he was not adequate. He feared that his kids would find trouble or worse that we would seek it out. I know it may sound sad that he lived in fear or lived with fear, but that fear also motivated him. It drove him to the top of his business. It did drive him towards conflict at times, but the same fear motivated him to resolve conflict and to move forward with growth and communication. I learned that what I thought was a judgmental eye was really an ability to see the difference between sophistication or imitation. And I learned that his cynical temperament was often a byproduct of having superiorly, superiorly high standards and hoping beyond hope that others would rise to meet his standards. This is a random thought. I'll get back to the narrative in a minute. Um, I remember when he took me to my first NFL game. This was so long ago that I was still a Redskins fan. <laughs> which, which, for the record, I've been a Cowboys fan since 1980. But this was a Redskins-Saints game in 1980. I remember the Redskins had a wide receiver named Ricky Thompson. He caught a long touchdown pass down the sidelines. And I remember riding home on the Metro and I was scared. Everybody was bigger than me. But I remember feeling safe with, with my hand in my dad's hand and knowing that even though all these big people were around, that I was going to be OK, that I was protected. I remember my dad was at everything I did. Every Friday night in high school, he gave me 20 bucks. And back then, $20, you could take your girlfriend out to the movies, buy some popcorn, and get a soda. And it was really important to him that I was able to do those things. I think some of those things that he didn't have the opportunity to do when he was a kid were that he had to work on a Friday night where I got to go out and be with my friends on a Friday night. You know, we didn't understand each other for a really long time. Um, my dad was kind of loud. He was kind of clumsy. He was awkward, and for a very long time, I punished him. I tried to run him off. I decided to give him the longest cold shoulder in the history of cold shoulders. I'd prompt him into fights. I'd poke, I'd prod, I'd ignore. I decided I'd be the biggest teenager in the history of teenagers, and he wouldn't give up. I remember times when we'd, I'd have a football game right after school. During his work day, and I'd look up in the stands and think, there's no way he's going to be there. Not today. And then I'd see, son of a bitch, he's there. <laughs> he came. He was at every game. I tried to run him off, and he wouldn't be run off. He came to everything I did, whatever the event, football, soccer, basketball, 
homecomings, proms, fundraisers. When I was a senior in high school, we had a fundraiser where they brought donkeys into the gym. And we played basketball on the backs of donkeys. My dad was there watching me play donkey basketball. He wouldn't give up. I think he viewed fatherhood as a journey, not, not a destination, and I admire that approach. I think it's the same way he built his business and probably, ultimately, the way he and my mom approached their marriage. My dad loved his country. He loved being from Detroit. He believed that any human, through the vehicle of education, could change their status in life. He was a huge believer in the magic of education. Of course, he wouldn't call it magic because he was a grinder. He built his business from scratch. He was up early and up late. What he lacked in grace, he made up for with elbow grease. He loved our mom, and as I've mentioned, he was, he was a flawed human being like all of us. Because I was so angry as a kid, I was constantly looking for other men, my brothers, my teachers, my coaches, my uncles, my grandfathers, to serve as father figures. It took me a long time to recognize that my dad was a role model for manhood. He was not soft and fuzzy. I even remember how rough his mustache was when he would try to kiss me when I was a kid. But he never stopped trying. He was a good role model for manhood and for adulthood. He, like many men of his era, I believe, really didn't quite know how to be a dad. He didn't know what to do. I'm imagining that his, that his kids actually scared the crap out of him. I'm imagining that a lot of the yelling that went on in our house when I was a kid was a byproduct of fear, but my dad was a good man. He modeled fidelity in, marriage, in his marriage and fidelity in his business and in the financial practices that he bestowed upon our family. He taught me loyalty. He taught me financial literacy. Even when our house was chaotic, he would celebrate our mom with flowers and gifts and nights out in fine restaurants. My parents grinded out 47 years of marriage. They had ups and downs, ins and outs, times of strife and times of bliss. But my dad was there providing for his family, doing the best he could. He exercised. He had a healthy diet. He loved to laugh and probably be the first to tell you that he should have laughed more in his life. His, to me, is kind of a story of metamorphosis. One of the reasons I really, I really haven't cried that much since he died is that especially in the last eight years since his first cancer diagnosis, he and I got to have the conversations that all parents and kids should have while everyone is still alive. On some levels, that first cancer was a blessing in disguise. It forced real conversation and real connection. It's a beautiful thing to get to say and to get to hear the words, I'm sorry, from the ones you love. Those words are liberating and cleansing. My dad, especially in his later years, was hard on himself and sometimes struggled to forgive himself for things that A, everyone else had already forgiven, and B, may not have been such awful transgressions in the first place. Part of my point is that even down to the end, he was engaging in self-exploration that was both difficult and admirable. I know that he died and the bitterness in my soul has long since departed. I've been struggling with what to say. I mean, do you get up at a guy's funeral and discuss imperfections? Is the thrill at the pinnacle or is it in the journey? My dad used to take me to a Redskin game once a year. My dad wasn't even really a football fan. But we used to go to RFK back when it was hard to get tickets. And we used to buy them from a scalper, I guess I should say ticket broker to be politically correct. And I wanted to be in the stadium hours before kickoff. I was oblivious to the fact that the later we bought the tickets, the better deal we would get. We always got into the game. I would watch him negotiate and bargain and schmooze all the time. I would be so nervous that we wouldn't score some tickets. Meanwhile, he knew the whole time we were going to get tickets. But dad was always preparing me for the worst. It was the pragmatism or the realism in him. I was a dreamer and he was a planner. Remember, this is the guy who told the five-year-old to find a backup plan. My dad let us make fun of him, and that's a special skill. He would always say, I'm glad I can be a source of entertainment for you. And my sister and I loved to tease him. Sometimes we kind of viewed him as a caricature. 
His hair could be a mess. When he ate, food might fling around the room. When he was on, he savored life. And both of those things, the hair and the flying food, were emblematic of his joy of life. Rebecca and I would find it so funny. We'd laugh at him, and we'd laugh with him, and he'd let us. He had nicknames, the chef for one. Teddy B was probably his most famous. One of the greatest gifts he gave us was the permission to laugh at him. Not everyone is self-possessed enough to allow that, and he did, and for that I am thankful. So my dad was good at the following, laughing, planning, grinding, learning. He even became a very good listener in his later years. He was a man who threw a great party and liked to party. My relationship with him taught me so much. It taught me the power of persistence. It taught me to be honest. My dad could be brutally honest, almost to a fault. And my relationship with him also taught me the value of a dollar and the value of a day's work. When I first graduated from undergrad, I worked with or for my dad for a year. I hated it. I hated wearing a tie every day. I hated sitting in a cub cubicle. But I got to see up close what he did. Day after day, I saw and sat with clients who came to him for counsel, people who entrusted him to make financial decisions on their behalf, people who had given him tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of their hard-earned money to invest. People put their entire financial future in my dad's hands, and he took his job seriously. He, I was learning, was a man of impeccable integrity. He used to tell me that he had to avoid even the impression of impropriety in his job. I was 23 years old, had no direction in my life, and my dad took me in. He showed me his world and he mentored me. He didn't know it at the time, or maybe he did, but I wasn't going to become a financial advisor. I was simply trying to figure out how to become a man. In many ways, he and I are very different men. We have different interests, different life philosophies, I always grab the sports page first, and he always grabs the front page first. But I am my father's son. That time with him molded me. He molded me. By working with him, by seeing the grace, honesty, and professionalism with which he handled his clients, I saw the grace, honesty, and professionalism that should translate into whatever I'm doing personally and professionally. He really was 100% committed to his clients' futures and 100% committed to his client's trust. It really makes me understand how he could tell a five-year-old to come up with a backup plan. It took me almost 42 years to understand my father. Now he's gone. I do believe that it took most of him, most of his 75 plus years to understand and feel comfortable in his world. Perhaps that's part of the master plan that you get to stick around long enough to understand and feel comfortable in your world. I know that my dad, to his last days, was inquisitive, contemplative, and introspective. I admire his quest for knowledge and understanding. So in honor of the grinder, the thinker, and the planner, I'm raising a metaphorical glass to the father who refused to leave my side with much love and respect. Thank you. to be the last person because I know you all have been sitting for a while, but I promise that my remarks will be less than 10 minutes. After my dad's passing a month ago, so many people reached out to me to tell me how much they adored him. So many of you remarked on my dad's humor. his support, his genuine interest in you as a person, and his overall joy of life. Some of the remarks I heard were, your dad was one of the greats. I should have gone first, sorry. <laughs> your dad was there for me at a very difficult time in my life. Ted's support was critical to my career. I always looked up to Ted. 
Ted was such a mensch. We owe a great deal to Ted for his wise counsel as we are comfortable in our retirement, and I have nothing but the fondest memories of Ted. It was so wonderful to hear those remarks and also so interesting because, as Adam said, my dad was really such a complicated man, and so many of the warm things that people remember about him were not always the things he shared with those of us closest to him. For the first half of my life, and for the first half of him being a father, my dad was not at all like the person described above. In fact, he was quite a difficult person. He was intimidating, he yelled a lot, he was frequently a bully to his immediate family, and truth be told, I did not like him very much. It took about 20 years before my dad began to offer those of us closest to him the same generosities that he offered the rest of the world. The parent that my father was not when I was a child became a wonderful parent to me as an adult. Time provided both my dad and I some distance from those early difficult days, and I began to see that life with my father was extremely funny often absurdly so. Let me give you a few examples. Like all good Jewish families, we spent a lot of time growing up eating at Chinese restaurants. <laughs> and my dad had a method for determining whether a Chinese restaurant was worthy of his return business. Sometime along the line, my father had eaten a dish which would become, for him, the absolute litmus test of Chinese cuisine. The dish was a whole fried fish with pork and black bean sauce. Somewhere my dad had eaten this dish and loved it. And being the person that he was, he had had the waiter write down, in Chinese, the name of this dish on a scrap of paper that he could keep for reference. So every time we went out for Chinese food, my father would dig into his wallet, pass the credit cards and gas receipts, and pull out a tattered, folded piece of paper with a few characters of Chinese written on it. He would bring this out with a flourish, show it to the surprised yet delighted Chinese waiter and ask, can you make this fish? It made Adam and I want to crawl <laughs> under the table out of embarrassment, but the waiters were always impressed and nodded knowingly as if this were indeed the most authentically Chinese dish of all time. And I can only imagine the scene of the waiter going back into the kitchen explaining how the Jewish guy wants the whole fried fish with pork and black bean sauce. But he always got that fish. As my brother mentioned and I mentioned, my father could be incredibly abrupt. And as you got to know him better and as he aged a bit, you could see he had a well-hidden soft side. When Adam moved home from college, he asked my mother if he could bring home his pet cat. The cat was named Bernie, after my dad's own father, Bernie Barr, or possibly after Bernie Kosar, but that's another discussion. My mother decided to broach the idea of the cat joining our household during a drive downtown to the Palm. Neither my mother's very soft touch, nor the fact that my dad was on the way to his favorite restaurant, nor even the fact that the cat was named Bernie, for my grandfather softened the news. My father hollered and yelled and spent the entire hour drive ranting and waving, ranting and raving, finger wagging the entire time about how the cat could stay exactly one week, and during that week, the cat must only stay in the basement, and that then a suitable home must be found. Well, you know how this story ended. Bernie and Ted had a love affair that lasted 18 years, and it wasn't long before my dad was tucking Bernie into bed every night and getting up at 2 a.m. to feed Bernie since Bernie couldn't make it through the night without a snack. This is all really true. And of course, as he was doing all this, my dad would be muttering, God damn pain in the ass cat. <laughs> but of course, he loved Bernie immensely. I mean, the whole Bernie story is just like my dad in a nutshell, you know, like his first approach is just slam it out of the park, angry, mad, and then 
he's in love with this cat for the rest of his life. And they both passed into old age together. Things with my dad remained humorous even in the last few years of his life. Several years ago, my dad told me that he had bought something for me and handed me enormous, an enormous box. What is that, I asked. It's the interchangeable food storage system, he said. It's what? It's the interchangeable food storage system, he said. It's like Tupperware. Every bottom is a top, and every top is a bottom. <laughs> I saw it advertised on TV, on an infomercial. Oh. <laughs> Dad, there's 40 pieces of Tupperware in that. How much leftovers do you think I have? He looked at me sheepishly as if at just that moment he realized he had indeed gotten to the point in life where the pitch of a late night infomercial was appealing. <laughs> well, he said, they were buy one, get one free, so I got one for your brother too. <laughs> <laughs> After the incident with the infomercial, I said to him, Dad, if I didn't realize it before now, I know for sure that you are definitely old. A lot of people would have gotten offended over that comment, but it, as Adam said, my dad didn't. He just laughed and said, yes, I suppose you are right. I learned from my dad that it's okay to laugh at yourself, and once Adam and I got over our intimidation of our dad, we did find endless pleasure in poking fun at him. And without fail, my father would just say, as Adam said, I'm glad that I can be such a source of entertainment for you. The other thing about my dad was that he was full of strange sayings. I've never heard anyone else use the expressions he did, and I'm not sure if he made them up or where he got them, but this remembrance would be incomplete if I didn't share a few of them with you. And in fact, several years ago, we got motivated and made a whole dictionary of them, which we gave to my dad, which will be out for you later. But if you walked in and you looked a little disheveled like you needed a shower, he would say that you looked like a refugee from a cabbage patch. <laughs> After an enjoyable meal at a favorite restaurant, he would always remark, the food was horrible and the portions were so small. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> if you were struggling with a decision, he would ask and answer, do you have trouble making decisions? Well, yes and no. <laughs> he had several terms that he used to refer to Adam and I. We were sometimes referred to as the royal short people. <laughs> Often he called us trumbaniks, a Yiddish word I didn't know the meaning of. He said this word with affection, and so I always supposed it meant something like little darlings or sweethearts. <laughs> when I looked up this word recently, I found it does not mean that at all. It actually means lazy person or boastful loudmouth. But <laughs> You never would have known it from the way he used it to address us. In addition to his unique sayings, he also had three pieces of basic parenting advice he would regularly dispense to us. First, always save for retirement. Second, never ever carry a balance on your credit card. Third, don't be a hero. Don't be a hero pretty much summed up his entire parenting philosophy when he said, don't be a hero, it could mean anything from don't drink and drive to don't jump off a bridge just because your friends are doing it or be sure to wear your seatbelt. I have wondered how it would feel to deal with my dad's passing, particularly since parts of the relationship were so difficult. The thing that has struck me the most is the value of time. Time can reveal so many things and if you have enough time, which my dad and I were ultimately blessed with, life can definitely surprise you. In the end, time gave both of us what we needed to reach a sort of redemption with one another. And I know we both desperately needed it. So, I love you, Dan. Don't be a hero.